welcome you. Thanks for coming back this Sunday. It's good to see you guys. Um, Easter was awesome last week. It took forever to clean up all the confetti on the floor, but uh, we did it. Actually, I didn't do it, but I'll take credit for it, you know, and uh, it, was, it was great. So, man, we had a great time last week, and uh, probably, probably the most people we've actually seen uh, in this building and online since, since we launched. So that was pretty exciting for us. Yeah, praise God. Praise God, praise God. <clears throat> All week long I've been praying for those seeds. God, what you did last week, that you would continue it. That you would continue it, right? That's what we're praying for. Um, we're not chasing numbers, we're chasing souls, right? And so, uh, yeah. So I'm glad. I'm glad you're here. And if you're in the room, welcome back, watching online. And man, Let's talk, about, let's talk about this last year for a little bit, okay? 2020, going into 2021, was a crazy time. Crazy time. I mean, all sorts of things happened, and we've been talking about this for months, so I'm not going to bore you with the stats again, but, but it's been crazy. It's been taxing. It's been depleting. Like, my, my, literally, my, my uh, emotional tank is empty. I don't know about you, at the end of the day, do you just find yourself like, I just don't want to talk to anybody, I don't want to do anything, like I'm done, right? I'm done. Well, man, but now that the sun is shining outside, right, the, the, the sun's coming out, and, uh, you know, people have either already had COVID, or maybe they got the vaccine, or whatever it is, but people are starting to come out now and enjoy life a little bit, which is nice to see as well. That's a good thing. I want to see that. That's great. Um, I believe this great. But do you guys remember, I don't know who was here in October, all right, I don't know if you were here in October, but I remember October when we first uh, started going back into in, in-person uh, gatherings indoors because we were meeting outside for the summer. But in October, we came inside the building and it was super weird. It felt like a middle school dance. You know, you know how you felt in middle school? Like this, okay? <laughs> you feel like this kid and it's like, okay, you, you was awkward. And I'm standing there and people are like trying to avoid people and not talk to people and it was... Super weird, super weird. Uh, it, I love this picture, that kid. I feel so bad for that kid. I don't know who that kid is, but God bless him. You know, I think he's right here on my screen here. Um, <laughs> but as we continue to emerge in this season, right, we're emerging. I believe one of our greatest challenges before us is not just the economy. It's not just social unrest. It's not all of the things that we hear in the news Although those things are super important and are real issues, I believe one of our greatest challenges, hear me when I say this, is the health of our relationships. The health of our relationships, more specifically, our friendships. Friendships. As I've been thinking through this message, I've been thinking about, um, about my friends and, and uh Growing up, it, a lot of reminiscing. A lot of, I got into a lot of trouble with good friends. You know what I'm saying? Good friends get you into a lot of trouble sometimes because you, you do things you probably shouldn't do. Uh, maybe they're bad friends, but they felt like good friends in the time. Um, but, you know, in the past six months, this is what I've been hearing, all right, w which is completely different. And I, I say this to show the contrast. People have been telling me, man, 2020 has been great for me. It's been the best financial year of my life. Actually, other than if it wasn't for this deadly virus, this year's been great. I had someone else tell me, man, you know what? Me and my wife got COVID, and we were stuck quarantined in a house together, and I can't tell you, that was probably the best thing that happened for our marriage. We, we, we were able to connect and, and be with each other. There's something about going through a tragedy together that bonds people together, right? Now, not every marriage is saying that, but this, this couple did. I heard it from a couple people, actually. Um, when it, which is great. That, that is great. It's, it, it's, uh, maybe those things are great, but as we continue to emerge out into uh, life, into the world, into, into, into the community, reigniting or, or reconvening our friendships might be a little bit harder. You wonder why? Because we were terrible at it before COVID. <laughs> We weren't great at it before COVID, and now that COVID's happened, we're, not, we're probably not better off for it. Um, loneliness was an issue before COVID, and I would say now it's worse. And the data shows that it doesn't matter if you're married, and it doesn't matter, it matter if you have kids. Um, that's not what's going to stop loneliness. You know, we've... We've lived in this 
this COVID era that has taught us to hunker down, take care of your family, stay safe, stay socially distant. And really what it's done is it's taught you to isolate yourself. The temptation is. The temptation is to isolate. And so although we need to take precautions and we needed to do these things, and I believe, you know, we've heard things like for the greater good and and all of that, and that's great. But it's also lied to us. It's lied to us. It's lied to us and told us a lie that we're believing that I don't need you. I don't need a friend. I don't need people. I don't need the church. I don't need community. In fact, look, it's been a whole year. I'm doing fine. I'm doing great. And it's the lie we've bought. Unintentionally. But that's where we're at. This is where I see the greatest one of the greatest needs we have right now. Now, if you're sitting here and you're feeling a spotlight on you about your friendship and you're feeling like a pretty poor friend, don't worry. You're probably in good company. I don't think anybody's like owning it or rocking it right now. So you can go ahead and tell the person next to you, uh, you're probably not a good friend. Go ahead, tell them. All right? And if you're by yourself, tell yourself that because it's probably true too. You're probably not a good friend. Make sure you say probably. Don't say you're not a good friend, okay? We're not trying to lose friends. (laughs) We're trying to be honest here. So that's what this series is all about. This series is about reengaging in community, purposeful community, in right relationships that lead us to follow Jesus. Because I think there's something of that nature that we have lost. To be honest, before COVID, nobody liked getting in anybody else's business. Nobody likes putting their stuff out there. So having a friend that can tell you things, hard truths, is especially when you've learned to be self-sufficient and kind of closed off, it's not as popular now as it was then either. But America's facing a growing environment of loneliness. Loneliness. So this series titled Not Alone is talking about that. That's what we're going to be for the next four weeks. <clears throat> In the past few years, studies have shown that the average American has gone from three, I don't know how they get these numbers, 3.2 friends to just 1.8 friends. Okay? Okay. That's interesting. From 3.2 to 1.8, Robert Putnam, who wrote the book Bowling Alone, uh, which was on the evaporation of community environments, writes that lately that 40% of Americans say they have one or no confidence. One or no confidence. That means that when something important, maybe tragic, maybe super heavy in your life, you have either one or nobody to go to. Which means what? Which means you eat it. You sit with it. Or or you go to other things to cope for it. The scarcity of friendship plays on our life and it turns uh, that longing for others into a disease called loneliness. Loneliness. Dr. Vivek Murthy, who who was once our Surgeon General, he wrote in 2017, The Loneliness Epidemic. He wrote over his years of practicing medicine, this is what he said, listen to this. He said, the most common pathology I saw was loneliness. The most common pathology I saw was loneliness. Loneliness is defined by uh, uh, one medical expert as the distressing feeling that accompanies discrepancies between one's desired and actual social relationships. So the, the, the distressing feeling that accompanies the discrepancies between one's desired and actual social relationships. It's easy. It's been easy for us this, this last year, right? Someone says, put on a mask. Okay, I can get behind that. They say, stay six feet apart because we don't want to spread this thing. Okay, I can get behind that. You know, we've gone through our city, right? Our city, our, our state has gone through all sorts of things. And, and for the most part, we've been compliant. Have we liked it? No, but we do it for 
the greater good, right? Because we want to do our part. It's been easy. But the healthy move of social distance for many has turned into an unhealthy move of isolation, which has led to loneliness. How many of you know, and I've said this before, you can be in a crowded room and feel lonely. You can be in a loving marriage and feel lonely. You can have kids who need you for everything and feel lonely. So loneliness is not contingent upon having these other things, having a wife or a husband, having kids, having a family. You can have a family and feel lonely. But that's not how God has designed us to live. He's not designed us that way. That's the crazy thing, right? We've kind of fallen into this rut that our culture has taught us to do intentionally or unintentionally. And we've bought this lie that actually I'm pretty good. I don't really need anybody. I'm good as long as I can go to work, I can get groceries, and there's toilet paper on the shelves. We're good, right? I don't really need anything else. That's a lie. That's a lie because we were not built that way. We were not built for that. The issue of loneliness and friendship is not something that the Bible is, avoids talking about, actually. Um, instead, we see a robust theology of relationships revealed all the way from the beginning. So we're going to jump to a couple passages this morning, all right? So stay with me. If you have your Bibles, you're going to want to open those or turn them on if you have an app. We're going to be talking about the spiritual practice of friendship. And the question I want to ask you this morning is this. How are you combating isolation with community? How are you combating isolation with community? And I don't mean your family members, okay? Your family members don't count. I mean, they count, just not in this equation, all right? So the first thing I want to talk about is the foundation of friendship. And for that, we're going to go to Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. You know, like I said, you know, as we talk about friendship, for a lot of you, this is going to take you back to these days when you look like this, right? Like this picture that we had earlier, the the kid, you know, this is going to take you back. When When you went to school for the first time, right, and you were worried you weren't going to have any friends, and you're wondering who's going to like you and who's not going to like you, uh, man, I can't get over that picture. I feel so bad for that kid. (laughs) And some of us, some of us are grown adults and still feel this way. Some of us still feel this way. In fact, not too long ago, I was talking with a friend of mine who um, was transitioning to another job. She, She had left one job because of the relationship issue. There were people that were kind of like bullies. It was an environment that she didn't feel safe or, or, or happy to be in. And so she switched jobs because of that, because there were bullies. She's a grown person. People are bullies. How many have met a bully before? Anybody? Who punched them? Be honest. You should have. I'm just playing. Some of us still have that feeling today as grown adults. Genesis chapter 1 and 2 is the creation narrative. The two chapters both convey um, God's creation of the world, of mankind, and then God speaking purpose into that creation, into mankind. This is what we get in the book of Genesis. It's after God creates man from the dust, and we Hopefully we know this story that he breathes into him, right? Into him, into his nostrils, the life, right? And then he puts this man in the garden and puts him to work. Right away, man, he was working, right? He tells him what to do, and, but this man is alone in this world. There are animals that come in too, but for him, he was alone. But then we see in this moment, Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. It is not good that the man should be alone. God speaks goodness into his creation, right? Uh, uh, 
But then in Genesis 2, God sees that man is alone in the garden working and living by himself, and he says it's not good. This isn't good. And right away, we see that we're not designed to be alone. All the introverts in the room are saying, I disagree, (laughs) right? But it's not true. It's good to have some quiet time, but you're not meant to be alone. We're not meant to be alone. God said it's not good that man should be alone. And there's this moment in God's vision where he sees that something's missing. He's saying, wait a minute, something's not right. This is not good. It's not good. Man needs a relationship. Man needs a community. In Genesis 2, God goes on to create the woman. So many times this passage is used to talk about marriage, and and which is good and right, because it does show uh, how the two have become one. He says, she's bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. But this moment communicates something even more than just marriage. Uh, We're created to be in community. The idea is aloneness. Okay? Aloneness. The answer for, for a helper was to the problem of aloneness, not to the problem of singleness. And God instills in us a need to be with others. It's not good for man to be alone. Chad Bird, he writes this. He says, despite God's perfect formation of man, aloneness is ungood for man. In a narrative full of goods and very goods, this is the first not good that we encounter. It is not good for the man to be alone precisely because he is not created to live as an isolated, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-actuating, self-identifying individual. There are no islands in the stream of humanity. I thought that was an excellent quote. Isolation, the removal of relationships is combative, combative to the human soul. And when we are left alone, here's what happens. Hear me when I say this, and maybe you've gone through this. You fall prey to your own devices. We move away from the heart of God, and we begin to feel the weight of loneliness. Maybe your heart even turns callous. It turns hard. There's like a layer, a thick layer that kind of coats over you where you're numb. I play guitar, and so my left, my left hand, my fingers, it's like nothing but like white dead skin because of all the callus, right? I can't feel the strings anymore because when you play for so long, you just develop these calluses so it doesn't hurt. But when you're first learning how to play a guitar, oh, man, it's like your fingers are on fire, right, Chris? You know, especially if those, the gauge of the string is super thick, man. But we need to come back. We need to come back to this so that we don't minimize the role of friendship in our lives. We we need to remember that our foundation in life comes back to this reality. Here is the reality. You are not alone. Creation, the creation story tells us it's not good for man to be alone. So what does God do? He fixes that problem. He gives you someone. He gives you someone relationship, the ability for relationship, the ability for friendship. So I want to spur you on in this moment, you know. I'm sure there are relationships over this last year in your life that have gone stale. I'm sure there's people that maybe you've just lost touch with people that you haven't talked to in a while, friendships that maybe have felt more distant, don't let that distance cause you to walk away from them. But instead, press in. And I know it's still complicated, right? We're, we're still in a complicated place right now. 
but we got to make it work. I mean, you could text them, you can call them, you can FaceTime. There's things you can do other than, you know, breathing in their face. You don't have to breathe in their face to be a friend. It's not a requirement, actually. You didn't know that, right? You don't need to breathe in someone's face, face in order to be their friend. You can do that without doing that. <laughs> so the question is, we need to get back to people. We need to get back to people because some of us, some of us are struggling a silent battle of loneliness, and you need to hear this morning you're not alone. Some of you are in a battle that nobody else knows you're in. You're battling a financial hardship. You're battling a sickness or disease. You're battling relationship issues. Your marriage is going through a really hard time. You're, 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 you're hurting for your kids. Your parents are are getting old and, 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 and you're having to take on more weight, things that you didn't, maybe you weren't ready for. There's all sorts of things that we go through and guess who we're talking to about it? Nobody. Because we have nobody. So the question is, are you seeking out community? Are you seeking out community? The second thing I want to talk about is the formula. So we're talking about the friendship, the foundation of friendship. Let's talk about the formula of friendship. And for that, we're going to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18. 1 Samuel chapter 18. <clears throat> we're created to be in community. And as the Bible progresses, right, as we read through the Bible, there's many examples of spiritual practice of friendship. But the most famous of them all is probably Jonathan and David. Jonathan and David. And before David became, you know, the most famous king in Israel, he was just a little boy, a shepherd boy, who was famous for killing Goliath. All right? The giant, right? He killed the Philistine giant. That's what he was known for. But he was a nobody, really. Um, it was after this moment, though, that he, uh, that he kind of uh, uh, slid into fame. And David found a real community, a friend in the son of King Saul. And his name was Jonathan. His name was Jonathan. In, Sa in 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 through 5, we'll see the parameters of the formula for their friendship. It says in verse 1, As soon as he had finished speaking to Saul, listen to this, the soul of Jonathan was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Those are not light words, Okay? When's the last time you told somebody that? My soul is knit to you. <laughs> right? Our souls are one. Sounds like a cheesy romantic movie that I wouldn't watch. Right? But there is a deep bond. From this friendship, we'll see the depth, uh, we see the depth of spiritual friendships. To be friends isn't just to know someone's uh, a name or occupation or family it's to know the depths of who they are. It says that David and Jonathan's friendship was a knitting of souls. And I like, I like that, you know. Uh, to, to be knit to the soul is a, is a Hebrew word that describes an intentional binding. Intentional. Hey, I'm feeding back here. Where's my song guy? I'm feeding back. And so he, he, he talks about the intentional binding. Often, it was often used to talk about political alliances uh, of people coming together, but here it is presented in the mutual self-giving of friendship. So basically, Jonathan and David met, and there was this bond. It clicked, like, hey, I like this guy. This guy is cool. He's all right with me, right? Uh, I asked Rob, one of our elders, he's sitting right over there. He's awake too. Thank you, Rob. You know, you know, and uh, I asked Rob, I said, uh, when he runs into another fitter, right? Rob's part of the uh, local, what is it, 597? 597. I said, hey, when you find somebody else, right, who's from your union, uh, how, what's the reaction? Do you have an instant bond with this person? And he said, this is what he said, and I'm reading what he texted me. He says, when I meet another brother fitter, especially from my local, I do feel an automatic bond where we talk alike. We understand each other's world, but I also have a massive respect for what they do for their craft. 
Now, on a vocation level, I see someone who's like me, and instantly I'm connected to this person. Like, yeah, my man, Local 597, that's my guy, right? I don't even know your name. doesn't matter. You're with me, right? I like you. It's kind of like when I see someone wearing a socks hat, I make a mention. I'm like, hey, I like your hat. I like your hat. It's a great hat. Don't know the person's name, but I like them already, right? There's a bond. Well, this bond is even greater than that. Their friendship bond was deeper than that of a vocational uh, camaraderie. It wasn't because they just worked at the same place that they were friends. This was different. Rob's Fitter brothers show a bond based on vocation, and there's a lot to be said about that. I think there's important, and I think about like police officers who have partners, right, where their life depends on this person or could. There is a definite bond there. Or I think about people who serve in our armed services, our armed forces, who their life is dependent upon the person next to them, uh, that they know that this person's got my back. There's a bond there, for sure. That is a bond. And I'm not trying to diminish that. But in David and Jonathan, this reveals to us a godly friendship, uh, what, what a godly friendship looks like. And it's not a generic relationship of talking about surface level things. It's getting underneath. It's moving to a relational care. Listen to verse, uh, verses 2 through 4. 1 Samuel chapter 18. And Saul took him that day and would not let him return to his father's house. So David is not allowed to go home now, basically. And then Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as his own soul. And Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him and gave it to David and his armor and even his sword and his bow and his belt. That's, that's interesting. It reminds me, uh, you know, I always used to love when, like, you know, new friends would come to the house and when my boys, you know, if there's a play date or something, they're playing. And there was always one of my boys... Uh, uh, usually Jaden, who would give, give stuff away. Manny was like that too. Manny would give you anything, even if it wasn't his, right? Right? Someone would come to the house and he just wanted to give you something. He, wanted to, he just wanted to be generous. And so he would give his toys away. And I'm like, whoa, 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 I just bought that, kid. Look, what are you doing? Don't give that away. But he was like that. And I, I kind of see this in, in Jonathan and David. He's like, hey, I'm giving you this. And there's three things in these verses that characterize friendship. Three things. One is love. Jonathan loved David as his own soul. Now, this is not a romantic love. Uh, this is as C.S. Lewis, who I'm going to talk about in a little bit too, he talks about in his book, The Four Loves, friendship love. Lewis remarks, friendship is, in a sense, the least natural of loves. It has least commerce with our nerves. There is nothing throaty about it, nothing that quickens the pulse or turns you red. It is essentially between individuals. The moment two people are friends, they have in some degree drawn, to, uh, drawn together apart from the herd. I was reading a book and it was talking about this, this perimeter. You could have 100 high school seniors in a room, right? 100 high school seniors. They all go to the same classes. They all have the same teachers. They have this, you know, the, the same type of structure. Um, they're all going to wear the same cap and gown. They're, they're sharing these experiences. But if you were to put them in the room, what you would see is that, that three or four would kind of go over here. And, and another three or four would go over here. And, and these like-minded people would, would kind of create a pocket within the perimeter. We call them cliques, Right? There would be these little cliques everywhere of people who are kind of like each other, and they find their space. Jonathan loved David. And the, characteriz the characterization of friendship love is, uh, is the selflessness of caring for one another. Jonathan's friendship, we'll see, had no gain for him. Jonathan absolutely got nothing out of this, really. But he was his friend. He was his friend. He only got lost. This is what took me back to my early childhood days. 
Uh, I remember going to school, and honestly, I, I, I used to get bused to school, and then I had to go to, like, the neighborhood school. And honestly, I wasn't too happy about walking. I wasn't too happy about walking by myself, and um, I didn't know how to deal with that. But what made it easier was my f- this kid I met across the, the street, or he was on the other side of the Vidoc, um, named Ramon Cervantes. And Ramon Cervantes was, you know... It was a kind of interesting family. They had like chickens and deers in their basement and, you know, but he was cool, you know, and he would walk with me and we would hang. And, and, and that journey, just walking to school, you know, eight or nine blocks made that better. And he was, he was my friend for pretty much through uh, my grammar school time. There's something about having that friend. The second thing we see from Jonathan and David is commitment. Jonathan made a a covenant with David. There is commitment in the relationship. No friendship, hear me, no friendship can survive without commitment because without commitment, there is no vulnerability. No vulnerability. This is equivalent to the person that you hang around with to only have fun. They're good for having fun, but when it comes to real things, if there's something going on in my marriage or, or something blows up, I don't call this person because there's no vulnerability. That's a superficial relationship. He's not even my actual friend. I would maybe call him an acquaintance. The commitment of friendship creates an atmosphere for care. When when you know that someone's got your back, like, dude, I'm with you. I'm not going anywhere. You can trust me. You call me, I will be there. I mean it. Any time of day, you call me, I will be there. That says something. That person, those, those friends are kind of now separating from the herd. It's a deeper bond. Can I trust you is a big question. Who here loves experimenting, trusting people, and getting hurt? Anybody? Nobody? Okay. Just checking. I'll make sure I'm in the right room. Can I trust you? Am I safe with you? If I tell you something that is deep on my heart, are you going to betray me? Are you going to go and gossip and tell other people? These are real things, right? This is what stops us from having friends. I don't trust you. I have a saying. I say I can trust you as far as I can throw you, right? But there's a commitment when it comes to friendship, this this healthy friendship, uh, a friendship that we find in the scriptures, There is a commitment, there is a trust, there is a vulnerability. Third, I see sacrifice. It says, Jonathan stripped himself of his robe and armor. This is an image of Jonathan saying, I give to you, David, my position. I I, I, I give you the prince's robe and armor. You are sharing in my status. Uh, He's saying, if I come up, you come up. What I have, you have. Because we're cool, we're tight, we're brothers. That's the sacrifice of real friendship. You may have heard me say that the phrase of conditional toleration, right? That's not friendship. That means I can tolerate you to a certain point, but after that point, I am done with you. That means if you cross this line, right, uh, uh, which isn't, it's not like a moral line or anything like that. It's just a line of, of what I can tolerate. That's not friendship. That's not friendship because it's, there's no sacrifice. See, the, that's the sacrifice of real friendship. It's not divided by status or privilege. It's, it's established in sacrifice. And in fact... <laughs> Friendship with David was actually a hindrance to Jonathan's life. Do you know why? Because this put him in direct conflict with his father. Look at this. This friendship is coming in between a paternal bond. 
of a, of a father and a son, of a king and a prince. But yet they find this friendship that challenges those. Kind of like that kid in the background screaming. He's challenging something. I don't know what it is. But Jonathan cared for David so much that he was willing to risk. He was willing to risk. It cost him something. Listen to this in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. You don't have to turn there. It says, One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin. But there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Let me say that again. One who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin, but there is a friend, there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. See, what I see here for the formula of friendship, of a godly friendship, uh, it communicates this. I am here with you. I am here with you. And there's a difference between sympathy and empathy. Who knows that? Right? Sympathy would say, I am here for you. Call me if you need anything. That looks really tough. I'm sorry you're going through that. I'm going to go eat now. You know, empathy is, no, I am here with you. You're in it. I'm going to sit with you in it. You're crying. I'm crying. You're rejoicing. I'm rejoicing. Sergio, uh, Sergio would always come to the house, you know, like during Christmas, and, and him and my son Junior have um, similar builds, so they wear like the same size. And so anytime Junior got like a new jacket or new shoes, and Sergio would come, man, I love the new jacket we got, right? <laughs> man, I love these new shoes we got, right? <laughs> you know, this past year we have heard, we've had phrases like, We've heard phrases like stick together or like in this together, sacrifice for the greater good. But we need to make sure that we regather our relationships in a way to say, I'm here with you. I'm here with you. I'm here with you. We all need relationships and friendships in our lives that communicate this, that you are not alone. See, that is one of the greatest lies the enemy can have on you right now is that you are alone. I don't have any real friends. Nobody really cares about me. Nobody really would take the time to understand. Or maybe you feel like, I know that sometimes I felt like this, I don't want to burden anybody else with all my drama, right? We use these excuses. And all of those are just defense mechanisms for, for uh, not being vulnerable and not taking risk. And that's called being a bad friend. See, friendship, friendship can be dangerous. See, we need friends, right? We need friends that, that, that say, I'm here with you, I'm praying for you, I'm not going anywhere, Oh, yeah, and get your butt up and start doing things right. Because sometimes friendship is dangerous. Friendship can be super dangerous. Uh, it allows someone to deliver a hard truth to you. And guess what? You invited it. Right? Scott Keith, in his book, uh, uh, he has a book of essays titled, Where Two or Three Are Gathered. And I was reading in his introduction and he was talking about the relationship between C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Uh, um, Tolkien, the guy who wrote um, Lord of the Rings, okay? And so these guys were part of an informal literary circle from Oxford University. They would meet once a week, sometimes twice a week, and they would talk about literacy, and then they would also share their writings. And let me tell you, these two guys are not the same. There were others in the group, but these definitely were the two uh, main guys. And it wasn't always nice. It wasn't always easy on the ears what they had to say about someone's craft, about their baby. You know, when you create something, you're like, hey, look what I made. And you're scared to kind of put it out there because someone's going to say, that thing's ugly, right? 
<laughs> but they would go at it. Their friendship was a catalyst. Their friendship was a catalyst. And Scott writes this about this kind of friendship, dangerous friendship. Listen to this. We need to regain some of these dangerous friendships. We need friendships like that, uh, that, like what Lewis and Tolkien shared. A friendship of this kind defined by two people, at least two people, taking the initiative and making the time to share, to care, and listen to the ideas of the other. This listening will turn into an examination and critique of the ideas proposed. Review and analysis will in due time result in a debate over these ideas. The debate is where the danger arises, but it is also where we experience iron sharpening iron. And as iron sharpens iron, the proverb says, one man sharpens another. I think we, we resist anybody telling us anything about who we are, or about what they see in us. It's easy to be defensive. No one wants to hear you're a terrible person, right? Or you have this character flaw that maybe you don't see. Or maybe this way that you're going about treating your wife isn't actually good. Or maybe the way that you talk to your children in public isn't actually good. Or maybe the way you act on the job is different from the way that you act at home isn't actually good. But it's easy to say, I don't need you. I don't need you to tell me that. I don't need you. And that couldn't be further from the truth. And then you wonder why you feel alone. See, if there is a formula for the kind of friendship that matters, that matters, vulnerability would be essential. Man, it takes a lot for a grown man to come and tell to another grown man, I don't have it all together. I am ruining our finances. I feel like I don't know how to love my wife the way I'm supposed to. I don't know how to respect my husband the way I'm supposed to. I don't know what I'm doing. Raising kids, Lord help me. I don't know what I'm doing. It takes a lot a lot to confess that to somebody and trust them that that's not going to be exploited and make you look like, you know, the worst case scenario. It only takes this much pride, though, to stop you from doing it. So are you letting your guard down to this kind of friendship? Are you seeking this type of friendship? Are you seeking this type of community? Are you letting your guard down to really do it? Do you have someone who you could turn to and say, right now, right now, you could call them up and say, I need help right now? Who would that person be? Don't name it out loud. <laughs> Lastly, I want to get through this quickly here, fellowship of friendship. For that, we're going to turn to Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47. We are created for friendship we need friendship. Lastly, we see that the followers of Christ, right, in the early church, they thrived in fellowship. The fellowship of friendship. Now, I'll say this. Friendship is not explicitly Christian, okay? You can find friends outside of Christianity. That is true, right? A lot of my friends growing up weren't Christians. But I will say this. The venue of the church was designed to be a cultivator of these types of relationships, these kinds of relationships, whether it is the relationships of friends, the relationships of spouses, the relationships of family. This is the place where we should be doing it best. This is an often quoted passage of Scripture, and we see the beginning of the church described in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, and it says, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. 
There's, these, there's this list of things that they were doing, but these two key words, they devoted themselves to the teaching and the fellowship. Devoted and fellowship. See, spiritual friendship is supposed to be the design of the church, a place where we worship God together and live together in fellowship. And we can't forget that that's the role that we've been given. That's the role that we've been given. We're called to as being the body of Christ, the body of believers. So we need to find a way to get together again. We need to find that way. Diedrich Bonhoeffer writes, The physical presence of other Christians is a source of incomparable joy and strength to the believer. There's something about, there's something about gathering, meeting together, opening up the scriptures, opening up the Bible, reading from it and saying, yes, I believe that, that I'm reminded of who I am. And the kindred spirits that I have in this room that bond us together because of the blood of Jesus makes us family. We need spaces to find these friendships. Now, friendship is not just a way to pass the time. So it's not just about having fun, although you should have fun, right? It's not a way to talk about all the shows that you've been binge watching, right? Although you can talk about that, but it's not only about that. It's not even just to talk about how bad the bears are for making these dumb moves, right? All those things happen with friends, but friends, friends take it a step further. It's a venue for Christ to move. When a friend meets with a friend and says, man, I care about you. I see something. Or, or let, me, let me sit with you in this. How can I pray for you? How can I hold you up? Do you need me to come over right now? A friend. Eugene Peterson writes, if we look carefully enough, we find covenants of friendship that help bind beginnings and endings into the covenant purposes of God. I like that. We're designed to be in community because in community we find the encouragement, the prayers, the confrontation, and the care to discover the love of God. A friend can push you to do things you never thought you could do. Think about what Jesus says in John chapter 15, verses 12 to 13. He says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Then he goes on to say, greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Do you only want friends if it costs you nothing? Do you keep friends at a distance as long as they don't get too close and get in your business? Because it's real easy to keep these acquaintances that we just like to have fun with, but there's actually no value in it. It's real easy because it makes us feel like we have friends, but really, we're alone. It's an illusion. It's an illusion. I remember my kids, I don't know if your kids do this, but I caught my kids, they would like watch YouTube videos of other kids playing video games. Have you seen this? Right? Right? And when I first saw this, I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And they're listening to these kids talk, or these people talk, right, as if they're in the room. To me, I was like, that is the perfect picture of pseudo-community. That's not real. You're not really there. They don't know you're watching. They're not talking to you. But it suffices. It makes them feel like they're in it with them. And it gives this illusion of community, this illusion of friendship. I know this YouTuber. I know this person. No, you don't. And as grown-ups, as people, we do the same thing. 
We sit in circles with people that we don't let in because we don't trust them, because we've, we've believed the lie, I don't need you. We've proven it to ourselves. I'm fine. We're doing good. See, the love of spiritual friendship, biblical friendship, directs our feet to live in the love of the one who laid down his life for us. Jesus laid down his life for us. He was the friend of sinners. And he says there's no greater love than this than he that would lay down his life for his friends. So let me just be very clear and very honest. You may be a bad friend. Right now today, and there may have been people in your life right now that have been bad friends for you. Over the next couple weeks, we're going to talk about good friends, bad friends, and all that stuff. But have you slipped in it? I'm going to invite the worship team to come back up this time. I've got a couple questions for you as we sing this song. This is, this is what we call the response time. You're not responding to me. You're responding to the Lord. The, the presence of God, the Holy Spirit that I believe is in you, if you are a believer, speaks to you through the Word of God, through the spoken Word of God, and He speaks to you about you. And so this morning, I'm asking you to consider what He's saying to you, that you could respond and do something about that. So I have three questions to maybe guide your thoughts right now as you do some soul care this morning. Have you slipped into the notion that friendship is a luxury, not a necessity? Have you slipped into the notion that friendship, real friendship, is a luxury, it's not a necessity? How are you doing at being a friend to someone? If the stats are right, you have 1.2 friends. <laughs> How are you doing at being a friend to that person? And maybe the question you could ask the Lord this morning is, Lord, what changes do I need to make when it comes to being a good friend? And hear me when I say this. I'm not talking about being a good friend to your wife or a good friend to your husband. I'm talking about being a good friend to somebody else. If you're a male, it's probably with another male. I feel like it's easier for women to get friends than guys. So that's why I'm kind of picking on the guys a little bit. But I would say it's a struggle for everybody if you don't trust anybody. How are you doing? God, what, what is it that I am missing, that I am glossing over, that I am, I am diminishing as an important role in my life that you created? You created me to not be alone. But yet I choose isolation. So as we sing this song, I want to invite you to think about that this morning and come to the Lord and say, Lord, help me, help me, help me have a heart that is right before you, God, and treats others the way that you want me to treat them, that nobody in this room would feel alone. Why don't we stand as we sing this closing song?